Well, we weren't able to play the last song I wanted for some... We've got a new program. It's always dicey here in the community centre anyway, so I couldn't play it. But it was um, full of joy and it was full of life because in these times, as things get darker, we're supposed to be lighter. You know that the glory of the Lord is revealed upon us, within us, fills us, overflows us, comes out of us. And, and so we can't afford to be like the world and walk around worrying, being, you know, dejected, like, oh my, and being so upset about what's happening in Israel that we don't see the victory that God's got. Because it's written all through the word, the victory, it's always there. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about this, this, this thing I've been talking about the last two weeks, that... Being a human being is no longer our race. That's right. I'm not a part of the human race anymore. I am a saint. I'm a child of God. I'm a member of the kingdom of God. I am one of God's race of people. Yeah. I am God's race. How amazing is that? We are God's race, a supernatural breed, never before seen upon the earth. This is who we are. This is who we are. And you know, the, the enemy has tried... See, what the enemy loves to do is he loves to keep us earthbound. If he can keep us earthbound in our thinking, if he can, think, it can keep us connected to what's going on in media, what's going on in government, you know, I just want to tell you that the government of this nation is on the way out. Yes. And that God is going to be doing a new thing. Because in reality, this nation, because of the prayers because of where this nation stands in God's end time plan, this nation, this nation will, will enable Jesus to carry the authority of the government of this nation upon his shoulders. Yes. There is a change coming. There is a change coming. You either rise up and step into it or you miss out, basically. <laughs> You're either a part of what God's doing or you're watching on the sidelines, but we're not meant to be spectators. We're meant to be participators. We're meant to be caught up in the very, uh, in the very heart of God that's at work on the earth right now. He is so amazing and so wonderful and so glorious and majestic in his outcomes and in his doings. But we need to remember who we are, that we are a member of God's race that our homeland is heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm in Australia because God got me born here. That was God's plan. He's given me a heavenly visa to live in this nation, but I'm a citizen of the heaven. I'm a citizen of, of his kingdom. Yes. This is who I am. First and foremost, my first allegiance is to heaven, to, to Yeshua, to the government of God. My first allegiance is to that second, to this nation. Yes. But my first allegiance is to him. Because I'm, I'm a new creation. We are all new creations, which means that we've been taken out of being a human being. We've been created a spiritual being. We still have a soul which is in the process of being renewed. I wish mine would hurry up. And then we have, you know, and then, but, but, and, but we're a new creation. We're a new being. We're a whole new race of people. And what the devil loves to do is to keep us thinking earthbound because he's the God of this world. So in, in warfare, in living, in, the way, in things that go on, if he can keep us thinking like a human being, if he can keep us um, caught up in media and that kind of stuff, if he can keep us connected to the earth instead of, see, uh, instead of being seated with Christ in heavenly places, he's got us on his turf. But if I rule and reign in life from, from, from the throne with Christ and I live this out in dominion authority... Anytime he comes against me, he's on my turf. And how dare the enemy come against a child of God? Amen. How dare he touch God's anointed? And this is the righteous anger that you have to allow to be released within you when sickness and disease comes upon your body, when there's not enough finances in the bank account, when there's problems in the family, when things aren't working out the way they should at work. It's not about flesh and blood. It's not about people. But you say, how dare the enemy come against me in Jesus' name? I live in the victory of Christ. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. How dare he? Now, there's some stuff that God might be wanting to work out in me. Fine. But how dare the enemy have a go? Because I can just step out of the way and say, Jesus, my big brother, go for it. Take him on. You've already defeated him. 
so I walk in his victory. But I want you to understand that one of the precious pearls of the kingdom of God that is going to be the most powerful thing that you can walk in in these end times is joy. It's the joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Jesus is joy. So I want to read a couple of things, and I want you to remember what we talked about. The first week I spoke about the fact that we are from another race was that when the Israelites in Jeremiah were taken captive and went to Babylon, the thing that the prophet told them was, don't think like you're a prisoner of war. Don't think like a captive. Think like this is my new home and I'm going to build houses and grow gardens. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have children. I'm going to live a normal life. I might seem to be a captive, but in the eyes of God, I'm a covenant person and I cannot afford to live or to think like a captive when you're imprisoned. They still had freedom and, G and Jeremiah was releasing freedom into them. So the thing is, you know, we've got to stop thinking naturally. We're a mix in our mind. I have yet to get to 100% Christ. Just when I think I'm getting close, the Holy Spirit says, really? And we're on another journey, you know? And then last week we talked about um, Peter got this amazing revelation of who Christ was. You know, you're the Messiah. Oh, my gosh, you're the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus says to Peter, well, well done. You've received this from the Father. And then he said, uh, and then he talked about the gates of hell shall not prevail against the ecclesia and all of this. And then a little bit later, he turns to the disciples of the apostles and he says to them, you know, this is what's going to happen. I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be buried. But I'm going to raise again on the third day. And Peter grabs his arm and says, not so, Lord, not so. This, this can't happen to you. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. Because you are not thinking the thoughts of God. You are thinking the thoughts of man. So any time we are thinking the thoughts of a human being, of a man, unrenewed man, an unbeliever, we are a stumbling stone to what Jesus is wanting to accomplish. And so one of the, the greatest gifts that he's given us is the ability to renew our minds. Because he said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. That means that our minds are anointed with the Messiah. Your mind is anointed. Not only that, I can, I've, I've got the mind, of I've got his mind, but, it, but my mind is also anointed. We're a whole different race of being. And the biggest challenge, I think, is not so much spiritual warfare, not so much the battles we go through, but the ability to live out of who we truly are. Who we truly are. Because I don't want Jesus speaking to me and say, you know, like looking at me, but speaking to what's happening through me and saying, get behind me, Satan. Like, that's not my idea of a fun afternoon. And so, you know, we've got my spirit, our spirits are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost, 100% God, 100% connected to God, 100% one with God, 100% a unity that cannot be separated, dissolved or broken into, 100%. My soul's in the process of being renewed, has to be in a better place now than when I first got born again. My body is, has been touched by the redemptive power of God and, and we've got the opportunity to live in divine health every day of our lives. But I will be getting a glorious body. I will be getting a classy chassis, classy chassis. <laughs> Looking forward to that. But, you know, but the thing is, we've got to learn to live spiritually right now. Right now, spiritually. In John chapter 1, verse 12, this is, you know, we read the Bible... But when you read this, and I do have the Amplified, I'm sorry, Kurt, I don't have the Youngs. <laughs> but he says, to as many as did receive and welcome him, Yeshua, he gave the authority, the power, the privilege, the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, rely on his name, who owe their birth neither to the bloods nor to the will of the flesh, nor to the will of man and that of a natural father, but to God. You owe your birth to God. You are born of God. Yes. How amazing is that? You are born of God. You are his, his child. He loves you so much. You are born of God. 
Ephesians 2.19 says that we are members of a royal household. Do you actually see yourself as royalty? Romans 8.17 says that you are an heir of God. So everything that God has, you have access to. Nothing is withheld from those who walk uprightly. And Romans 8.17 also says that you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So everything Jesus has, you are right there with him, accessing everything Jesus accesses. You access the Father, you access the Holy Spirit, you access the provision, you access everything that Jesus has. Or do you sense, do you think in your life that things are being withheld? Because that's not the truth. That's the lie that the enemy wants us to believe. And um, Danielle and I, we know, are doing our Bible college Six nights a week, aren't we, babe? Doing it, loving it, really enjoying it, but tired. <laughs> but one of the things that we were watching, um, Myron Golden, he's the one we're following in business, he said that you either live by your identity, which is in Christ, or your lie identity. The lie that Satan has placed over your identity. Too old, too fat, too inexperienced, too experienced, too qualified, um, too whatever. He says the lie identity. We're from the wrong, the wrong culture, the wrong race. The lie identity that's been placed over us. And we've got to remember right now that that lie identity is not who we are. My true identity is Christ. He is being fully formed in me. I'm being conformed to his image. I'm growing into the fullness and the stature of Christ. Christ is our identity. Amen. And, and so was recognising which identity am I living out of? Am I living out of my true identity or am I living out of the lie identity? Liability. liability to the lie identity, yeah. And so it's recognising these things. And so I think, I think we get bogged down in the West by thinking it's about stuff we know and, and how much time I've prayed and how much time I've studied the word and what I can recite from the word. It's got nothing to do with that. It's good to pray. It's good to get in the word. But really, how's your relationship with Yeshua? How is your relationship with him? How close are you to him? Are you closer than what you were six months ago? Or has the fire kind of dwindled a little? It's about relationship. And because I love him, because he loves me, and I can only first love him because he first loved us, right? Because of his love, I can walk with him and talk with him. And he fills my life with himself. And out of that love, I want to get into the word. Because he's the word. I've got 66 love letters from my heavenly father written to me that I love letters from heaven. You know, like that you send home. And um, we're just so blessed. But sometimes I think we forget and we get burdened because of the Western mindset. We forget that, I don't know how to phrase it, but we forget that everything in life is sacred. Everything in life has the kiss of the Father on it. Everything is touched by the breath of God. Nature creation, even the shambles of government. It started from a godly foundation. And so it's, it's recognising that God is wanting to do something amazing with his race of people, with his people. And 2 Corinthians 5.17, you are a brand new creation. Nothing like you was ever seen on this planet before. How cool is that? I think that's amazing. Brand new creation, a supernatural race of beings that, you know, like Mama Jenkins, when she walked around that psychiatric hospital, which was dead because of all the demonic activity in that hospital, but everywhere she walked, when she lifted her foot, grass was growing immediately under her feet. So much was she and had the spirit of life on the inside of her that it just oozed out into dry demonic ground and brittle ground and released life. Yeah, I can't remember who it was. I was trying to think who it was. But it was one of the guys that taught on healing, an old guy. But I, it was, I don't know whether it was, I don't know who it was. I'm not going to say because I can't remember, but I know I've read it in several books. And 
he got this um, well-known you know, minister and his wife to come and pray for him because he was ready to go home. He was of an old age. He's ready to go home, right? But he couldn't die. He was too full of life. And so he said to them, you're going to have to come and pray for me because God said it's time to come home. He said, but I can't die. I've got too much life on the inside. You need to come and pray some of it out. <laughs> so they came and they spent a couple of hours praying for him and they're getting pretty sozzled. <laughs> but he says, still too much life. You need to come back. I think they made three trips until finally he said, okay, that's good. I can go home now. And he just closed his eyes and went home. But, you know, he knew who he was. He knew he was a new creation. He knew he was no longer a human being. John G. Lake, when he destroyed the, uh, the bubonic plague germs in his hands, you know, he knew who he was in Christ. He knew that no sickness, no disease, no illness, no pain, no infirmity could touch his body because he was so in Christ and Christ was so in him that even bubonic plague germs would die and they did under the microscope and the scientists were absolutely baffled. This is who we truly are. This is, what we, this is what we have. But until we learn how to release it, how to live it, how to step into it, you know, life's going to be a bit of an up and down journey. I don't want up and down. I want straight up, yeah. right? I just want straight up. I just want whatever God's got. And I really don't want to hassle with the flesh. It's dead. It was crucified with Christ. And, you know, and it keeps popping up and saying, I'm back. And I say, well, get back where you belong. Get back, you know, because I'm I'm. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me who lives. Who lives within us? Christ lives within us. Oh, my goodness, if Christ is living within me, oh, it's just so good because the wisdom is there, the grace is there, the joy is there, the faith is there, the peace is there, the, the discernment is there. Christ is living in me. Oh, it's just like it gets rid of everything, every limitation, everything that holds us down. But sometimes I forget, I think we forget, that the gospel is good news. It's good news. If you have a look at our faces, maybe not so much good. Maybe a little bit of good news. Maybe not a lot of good news. But it's good news. It really is good news. But have we forgotten that? Have we forgotten that the gospel is good news? So anytime I, I just release a promise of God, I release the name of Yeshua, I'm releasing good news. Oh my goodness, you've only got a week to live. I've got some good news for you. You know, his name is Yeshua. I've got some stuff for you. Let me tell you. So we've got to get back into remembering what the kingdom of heaven is like because if we don't live like it's, if we don't know what that's like, how can we bring it to earth? So let me tell you what the kingdom of God is not like. It's not like worry. It's not like anxiety. It's not like poverty. It's not like lack. It's not like indecisiveness. It's none of those things. It's a relationship that you have with the Lord. And we bring heaven to earth. And so that's why one of the reasons, because we're supposed to be formulating whatever, a colony of heaven on earth. Every nation's been colonised. The Garden of Eden was colonised by Satan. And since then, every nation's been colonised. Every nation has been colonised. Well, I think it's about time that we colonised earth the way God wants it to be colonised. Right, let's bring the good news of God's colonisation to earth. Let's let our families, this house, let it be you know, a colony of heaven on earth. Yeah. So I just want to read you some things first and foremost. And then I want you to think a little bit. We don't have to think too much. But this book, and I bought some copies. Every now and again, I just think, oh, God, I need, I need something. And this is the book I pick up, The Happy Gospel. Um, End Effortless Union with a Happy God. Yeah. So I think we have two or three copies down the back. But let me read some stuff out of it. Um, I've got my head on the side because the page numbers are on the side. This is from Adam Clark's commentary. And the English word good has Anglo-Saxon origins and it seems that the words good and God were co-relative terms. But this is what Adam Clark says. The good being 
a fountain of infinite benevolence and beneficence towards his creatures, the eternal, independent, self-existent being, the being whose purposes and actions spring from himself without foreign motive or influence, he who is absolute in dominion, the most pure, the most simple, the most spiritual of all essences, true and holy, the cause of all being, the upholder of all things, infinitely happy because infinitely perfect and eternally self-sufficient, needing nothing that he has made, illimitable in his immensity, inconceivable in his mode of existence and indescribable in his essence, known fully only to himself because an infinite mind can be fully apprehended only by itself. In a word, a being who from his infinite wisdom cannot err, cannot be deceived, and who from his infinite goodness can do nothing but what is eternally just, right, and kind. Sometimes I think we forget the nature of our Father. And let me just read this. It says in, um, this is all based on Romans 1.1, 1, 1, and this is the Coney Bear translation. Coney Bear, C-O-N-Y-B-E-A-R-E. -E. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but it's his translation. He says, I, like Paul, have been set apart for its publishing. So how much do we publish the good news? It doesn't necessarily have to be in a book. But this is by the Woost translation. I am a bond slave by nature, belonging to Christ Jesus, an ambassador of divine summons. You have been divinely summoned, permanently separated to God's good news, permanently separated, not temporarily, not half in, half out, but permanently separated to God's good news. And then in verse uh, in First Timothy one eleven, I love this. Let me just read it out of the Amplified. First Timothy, chapter one, verse eleven. I have felt like dancing. Just you know, like oh, just there's such a. He's just amazing. First Timothy, chapter one, verse eleven. It says, as laid down by the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. He's talking above that about wholesome teaching and sound doctrine as laid down by the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. And Rotherham, Rotherham translates it like this, the glad message of a happy God. The glad message of a happy God. The nature of the gospel is eternal gladness and joy is its native tongue. So when you come before the throne room to the Father, do you see his face beam with joy as you enter? Or is it kind of like, well, I'm here and I'm just praying. But as a father, don't you think he absolutely, oh my gosh, here comes Mika. Whoa, you know, roll out the red carpet. Here's Mika. I love it when she comes to visit. And he's got the, the brag photos of a, a life and a destiny book there. And he's so excited about the fact that she's come into his presence. Or, um, you know, or anyone, Charles, anyone here, he gets excited. He's thrilled. He's happy that you've come into his presence. Or do we think that he's kind of like God? And we've just come before him in prayer and not come back to the, the relationship of father. Where are you in your relationship? He is besotted with you, yes. adores you. You're his children. Martin Luther says, oh, I love this. I get so like, I'm good when I get drunk because it's in my bedroom. But oh my gosh. Martin Luther says, we must earnestly endeavour to learn this practice or at the least to attain to some knowledge thereof. And we must raise ourselves up with this consideration that the gospel is nothing else but laughter and joy. 
laughter and joy. And if you get the Moffat's translation, every time it says blessed, it's blissful. It's bliss. You know, we're blessed. He says, I'm blissed. So we've got to really recognise what we have. And I know that there's spiritual warfare and I know there's intercession. But if we're not coming from a place of lightness, if we're not coming from a place of the victory of Christ, then, you know, we've already set ourselves up for a battle that we're not quite ready for. So it's, a, it's, the, it's good news. He's a happy, he's happy. Nothing shakes God off the throne. Nothing causes Yahweh to fall off in fear. Nothing says, oh, I wasn't expecting that. He has got it all planned. He already knows everything. My goodness, why are we living such, such little lives without the boldness of faith? Boldness of I'm coming into the presence of Yahweh. He's my daddy and he loves it when I come into his presence. He gets so thrilled when I'm there. He makes room for me. He tells the angels to get aside. Suzette's coming in. Gwen's coming in. My family's coming in. The House of Open Heaven Ministries meeting. Come on, make room for them. We're all here. You know, this, this, we've got to, we've got to understand where you're coming from. We, we, we get so, I was going to say suckered in, into living such kind of like lives that are, are held down by circumstances and situations and lack and all of this kind of stuff instead of going to Papa and saying, hey, Papa, I need an increase in my income. Bit more pocket money. Bit more pocket money. Things have gone up down here. Petrol's gone up. Things have gone up down here. Need a bit more pocket money, please. Like, honestly, where has the joy in your relationship with Father? Are you joyful in his presence? Do you need the thingy? So it's, it's kind of like, come on. So if you stop and think what Jesus has done, Yeshua has done, stop and think about it for a minute. Stop and think. I was headed for death, but now I have eternal life. Stop and think about, isn't that just enough? I was headed to hell. But now I'm going to heaven. Well, that's good. But that's in the distant. But Jesus then came and gave me abundant life. So I can have a great life down here. Oh, wow. So you stop and think about, you know, the division that Yeshua has made, not just even between the old covenant and the new covenant, but between how we lived and how we are to live now. And I wrote a few of these things down and I got so happy. You know, under the law, there are demands. The law demands that you do this and you do that and you make this sacrifice. The law demands. But grace is a completely different thing. And don't we stand in grace? Grace doesn't demand. Grace imparts. We've got uh, sin and death, the law of sin and death. But, but you know, I've, I've, oh gosh, <laughs> we've got the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We've got righteousness. We've got abundant life. We've got eternal life. So there was the spirit of the law of, son, the law of sin and death, but now spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I was a slave to sin, but now I'm totally free. I now, I, you know, I was, I, I'm dead to sin now and alive to God. The law exposes sin. You know, the law says, oh, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, and it shows us where we're going wrong. The law reveals all these things. But Christ got rid of our sin like we never had sinned. Yeah. Thank you. We're justified as if I'd never, ever, ever sinned. And when the devil goes looking for what I've done, he can't find it because I've been justified. I've been acquitted. <laughs> You know, like, come on. There might be some stuff I've got to deal with with iniquity. But, oh, my gosh, God threw my sins way out into the sea of forgetfulness. They can't be found. Right? We're completely free. What is it that keeps us mired to this, this muddy slime instead of standing on the rock of Jesus? Like, he's done so much for us. And so, you know, there's other things. Oh, my gosh, we are so blessed. We're the most blessed of people. We are the most blessed. 
We've, you know, we used to be sin conscious. Now we're righteousness conscious. We used to look, recognize, oh, I failed at this and I failed at that. What's the point of even trying? But now we're more than conquerors in Christ. He always causes us to triumph. You know, we're, we're, oh my, we're victorious. You know, it used to be about my works. Well, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've studied the word, I've spent so much time in God. But, you know, but that's all rubbish. That's religion. That's bondage. Now it's about what Yeshua has done for us at the cross. It's about him. It's about what he has done. And he's got nothing else further to do because he said it's finished. It's finished. He's done it all. And so it's recognizing you've been set free. Goodness, why are we sitting around like, we've been set free. Oh. There's such a freedom, but we have tended to forget because we've got a mix in our mind of Old Testament, New Testament. We've got a mix in our mind of human thinking and, and divine thinking. We've got this mix, and God hates mix. He loves purity. You know, so he, he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, listen, guys. Well, Paul's saying, listen, guys. He says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. Well, I don't know about you, but I tend to crawl off. Yes, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you ask. What, you want me to do what? Oh, I'm not sure about that. I, I, need to, I need to check and make sure that that's you, God, you know. But we're supposed to stay on the altar. We're supposed to stay there and allow him to do with us whatever he wants because he knows best. I'm of the age where I remember that TV show, Father Knows Best. And every now and again, I just have to tell myself, it's not about what you think. Father Knows Best. Just do it. You know, but, he, but we've got to stay on that living sacrifice. By the mercies of God, he said, by the mercy of God, you can't even do it in your own strength. By the mercy of God, he said, I want you to present yourself as a living sacrifice. And then it goes on in 12.2, and you can't have the renewal of your mind without verse 1, because Romans 12.2 starts with and. Mm -hmm. And don't be conformed to this world, mm -hmm. but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove the good, acceptable, pleasing, per perfect will of the Father. So we've got to renew our mind, right? Yes. What am I thinking? Oh, my gosh, I think that's a human thought. Okay. Oh, I think that was a religious thought. Okay. So we bring our thoughts into obedience to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. Bring your thoughts into obedience. This is, this is what we do with the work of grace, the work of the Holy Ghost. This is what we do. It used to be about our performance. Are we good enough? Qualified enough? Can we do this? But now it's about Christ's passion. Yes. It's about his passion. It's not about my performance. You know, I'm, he's my qualification. He's my qualification to live. He's my qualification to be a minister of the gospel. He's my qualification in the marketplace, in business. He's my qualification. It's, it's about his passion, his passion. Do you think he went to the cross because it was duty? He said for the joy that was set before him, he endured that because he knew he was going to have us. He went through that because he loved us. He wanted us. Can you imagine that? Yes. So it's not about our performance. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about his passion. It's not about self-consciousness. Oh, I, you know, my mum was incredibly shy. We never had people to the home for a meal, ever, because she was always thinking, well, I'm not a good enough cook, and, and she, she would just be so shy and tongue-tied and everything. So dad was fine, and her grandchildren were fine, but no one else. It was very rare that we had anyone as a guest for a meal, and afternoon tea was absolutely horrendous because mum found it so hard. But that was self-conscious, right? Yeah. That was not Christ-conscious. And we are still self-conscious sometimes in the way we live instead of being Christ-conscious. We, we, we have the opportunity to be sick, diseased, infirm or full of pain. But Jesus has given us the opportunity to live in divine health, not just good health or great health or perfect health, but divine health. I live, we live in the health of Christ, in the health of Yeshua. We live in his health. You know, he destroyed poverty at the cross. Anytime there's lack or debt or need, he destroyed that. And so we've got to start thinking, well, I'm just going to go to Papa God because man, he's got deep pockets. And the, and the streets are paved with gold. 
He can meet this need. doesn't matter what it is. He can meet this need. We just receive. Being a child of God, you don't have to beg. You just say, Father, I, I receive. One of my sons, my youngest son, was a real prayer warrior. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> Got to the stage when we wanted anything, we'd say, just go and talk to David. David will pray for you. David's good at prayer. Because nearly everything he prayed for, he wanted to go to a private school, got a scholarship that he didn't even know was available. Somebody came and told him. Um, he wanted to go on a yacht on a holiday. I'm a single mum, right? I'm working part-time. I've got five children. He wants to go on a yacht's holiday. So I said, well, if you want to go on a yacht's holiday, pray it in, buddy. Well, he did. And the rest of us stood on the, on the dead. Uh, <laughs> everything he prayed for, he got except one thing. And he even, like he did, damage to his, his knees and his back because he was a skateboarder, almost pro. Um, but God healed him. Like he, he just said, no, I'm not going to the doctor. God will heal me and God would. <sighs> So it would make us feel very, you know, like, we'll just get him to pray because I'm obviously not in the race. <laughs> but the one thing he prayed for that he never got was a horse. Because I thought, I, I am struggling to feed five kids. Now he wants me to feed a horse. And where am I going to put it? My backyard? No. So no horse. But I never told him it was no horse, God. No horse. <laughs> But he just knew that, that his, and, and he never asked for anything in his prayers. This is what we learned from him. He never asked for anything. He'd just go before Father and say, Father, I believe I receive. I believe I receive. So he was deaf and he was going to be stone deaf if we didn't have a, an operation. And the operation was 18 months off, but, and he would have been stone deaf by then. So, but... Anyway, he, he was healed. We had the op, but he was also healed later when stuff tried to go wrong. And, um, and he was baptised at the age of three or four, I think, because he was already speaking in tongues. And, um, and he went up for, for healing for his ears. And the guy says to him, he, he really rebuked us. He says, what you see is a toddler, is a young, young child. He says, but what I see is a man of God. And I see a man who prays, you know. And when he started to go off the rails in, in teenage years, Pastor knew all he had to do was ask David to come in once a week to visit with him and they'd worship and pray. Just straighten him right out. He just responded to that. But the thing is, he just said, Father, I believe I receive. I believe I receive. It was part of his inheritance. It was part of what belonged to him. There wasn't a big, oh, I need this money. You know, the, the electricity bill's got to be paid. It's got to be paid by this state. And I haven't got enough. Can you please? There was no begging. It was just, I believe I receive, Father. You know that this is what I want. I believe I receive. Because he knew that the Father loved him enough to give him what was on his heart. And we learned a lot from him with regards to that. It's the passion of Christ. It's the love of the Father. It's the friendship of the Holy Spirit. It's the fact that you've got the, the, the inheritance to live in divine health and to be prosperous, to be wise, instead of being fearful, to be trusting. Instead of to, in, you, we were lost, but now I'm found, praise God, and positioned right where I need to be. Instead of being anxious, we can be expectant. Instead of being cursed, we're blessed. And everything because of Yeshua. He is the dividing line. He is the dividing line. He is. And so the more we allow Yeshua to, to come alive to us, the more we say, Yeshua, I want you to be more real to me than anybody else in my life. I want to see you more clearly, follow you more dearly, love you, love you more. I want to, I want to know you, Yeshua. You know, in John 15, it says, I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends. Have you got a friendship with Yeshua? Is he your best friend? Because slaves know what their master's doing and they do what they're told, but friends have a different relationship altogether. You enjoy going out and doing stuff with your friends. It's Yeshua that makes the difference. You know, have we forgotten the gospel is good news? Have we forgotten 
that Yahweh actually sings songs of deliverance over us, that he dances around us. He dances around us. Have we forgotten that? We are so blessed. But we're living at this level instead of living as a member of, of a supernatural race. Every time you walk into a room, you can change the atmosphere just by the, the glory and the presence that you carry. You change it. You carry the presence of the Lord. But it's joy. Joy is the native tongue in heaven. Joy. And remember what it says in Nehemiah, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So not a lot of joy, not a lot of strength. Massive joy, massive strength. Joy is the barometer for how strong you are in the realm of the spirit. So the more you come into spiritual warfare, the more you feel you've got to stand and contend for the faith, for your family or whatever, the more joy there should be oozing out of you because that's where your strength is. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's Yeshua that makes the difference. He's just amazing and he's wonderful. And look in John chapter 3, 16. Now we all know that verse. But it's verse 17 that, that is really beautiful. Verse 16, and this is the Amplified. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to or relies on him shall not perish, shall not come to destruction or be lost, but have eternal everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation. The world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through Yeshua. That is the heart of the Father. We are a supernatural race. Jesus is living on the inside of us and we are living in him. We are inseparable from him. It's like it cannot be separated. The unity that we have spirit to spirit, um, you know, he, he clothes us. His wraparound presence goes around us. You are, we are the most blessed of all people. The blessed of all people. And he is so joyous that you're in his family. Like he loves the fact that you're his family, loves you. Matthew chapter 3, verse, um, I don't know where I am. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. When Jesus was baptised, he went up at once out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on Yeshua. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my Beloved, in whom I delight. This is my Son, my Beloved, in whom I delight. But you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, right? So therefore the Father is saying of you that you are his son, his daughter, that you are his beloved and that he delights in you. You are God's pleasure. You are God's delight. You are his favourite. Yep, no, I'm, I'm, there's room for me. <laughs> But, you know, but this, this, is, this is what it's all about. If we want to bring heaven to earth, we've got to access heavenly happiness or joy to make it earth's delight. Right? So whatever is in your life that is not of heaven should not be there, has no legal right to be there. So, you know, we need to start living our lives heavenly, full of heaven, full of joy, full of glory, full of beauty, full of laughter. You know, like the, the, the throne room and in God's throne room is incredible. There's, there's, you know, green rainbows and thunder and lightning and flashes of fire and there's, there's people throwing crowns, you know, holy, 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 and all the elders and everybody yelling out. It's not a quiet place. You're allowed to be a little bit raucous in his family. You ever had, you know, grandkids come into your house? Yeah. 
They do not know the word quiet. It's basically, yeah, that fridge is open, shut, open, shut, open, shut. Running around, don't, don't, don't go too close to the bench, you know, because their little head's sort of like just close. All that, but it's fabulous and it's noisy and it's wonderful. Don't you think, because he said, you've got to become like little children to enter the kingdom. How childlike are you in his presence? How childlike are you? You're still growing up. This is a week to reappraise your relationship and recognize that he's full of goodness and joy and laughter and song and he dances. Hey, Mika. <laughs> he dances and hugs. And his wraparound presence is his hug. You know, the, the um, armor of God is his kiss. Um, we are just so blessed, but we have to take down the heavenly joy and make it earthly delight. In Luke chapter 5, verse 37, it says, now I say that it says, it talks about new wine, old wine skins, all of that. Here's a little bit of a different slant. No one pours new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the fresh wine will burst the skins and it'll be spilled and the skins will be ruined. New wine must be put into fresh wine skin. What I am, uh, what I, this is my, this is my, the old wine skin was Suzette before she was born again. That's what the old wine skin is. We talk about the new wine skin and the new wine being new moves of the Holy Spirit and all of that, and that's true. But, you know, maybe... Maybe the old wineskin was who I was before Christ and the Holy Spirit just could not be poured into that because it wouldn't hold it. But when I became born again, the Holy Spirit came and I'm filled with new wine. Possibly that's it. John chapter 2, when they talked about the stone water pots and filled them with water, just ordinary stone pots filled with water, nothing extravagant, nothing glorious about it, just stone pots and water. But when Jesus touched them like he touched us, it became full of of intoxicating wine those water those stone water pots were us in our old creation but in this new creation we're full of intoxicating wine not just for us but to throw it out on others we slosh the wine out over onto others you know everywhere we go we just slosh a few drops here and there you know honestly we've got to start living like we're living in heaven and this is nothing that we can do I cannot do this in my own strength. I can't do this by making up my mind. I'm going to do this. I can't do this because I'm going to decree it so many times a day. I can't do this. But I can come before the Father and say, Father, I, I want to express your heaven on earth. And so I thank you that by the work of grace, the power of favour, the Holy Ghost, whatever you want to do, you, you, you empower me to do this. Waves of glory to empower me to do this. Waves of glory to empower me to do this. And he will do it. And when he does it, it's effortless change. I know when I'm changing by my own strength because it is not effortless. <laughs> it is not. And I get cranky and upset and frustrated and two steps forward and four steps back and the whole thing. But when I'm allowing him to do it in me, it's effortless change. Yeah. And that's where he wants to take us. Effortless change effortless change to bring joy to earth because as the days get darker as whatever happens happens because who you know this I, I'm stopped listening to the news so I really am not aware too much of what's going on I just I said to the father I just want to hear what you want me to know I don't want to be contaminated by media or or this is happening or that's happening so I haven't listened to the news for a few months I figure if there's anything important, I'm going to see it in headlines somewhere or somebody's going to tell me. But I just want to hear what God is saying. I just want him. I just want him. I just want to live his, you know, the, the life of Christ in me. The world needs heaven. It was designed to reflect heaven. At the very beginning, the earth was made to reflect heaven. 
and we've been given an opportunity to bring heaven to earth. Your kingdom has come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's got to be in us first. And when we get the revelation that we are a supernatural race, no longer a human being, I, I'm, I'm still, I have a body, I have a soul, I function on the earth. <laughs> Sorry, random thought, a bit like a functioning alcoholic. <laughs> highly functioning alcoholic but I'm inebriated with the Holy Ghost but I'm highly functioning you know what so when we start to live from the spirit when we start to release the joy when we start to recognize oh wait a minute Jesus is the big divide and I ain't going back for anything I'm not going back I'm not going to be like the Israelites who said I want to go back and taste the onions and the garlics you know like I don't want to go back for that I don't want to go back there's nothing back there that was that great I want what he's got. I want him. More than anything else, I want to leave a legacy of joy in the people around me. When I got born again, it was into a Catholic charismatic group. And there were some priests and nuns who got born again, spirit-filled, and they all said there weren't any chance of us going to Rome. All our ambitions in the priesthood kind of died when we got born again, spirit-filled. But there was one father, well, I'm calling that, I guess, one priest, that um, we just called him a joy germ because that's what he was. He was a joy germ. He just laughed, deposited joy into everybody. Um, even when he counseled people, it was from a lightness and a joy and, oh, God's got this. What are you worried about kind of thing? And I remember once he backed into an urn as I, he was talking and he backed up and he backed into the urn and it dripped down his uh, <clears throat> posterior and he said, nobody lay hands. <laughs> nobody lay hands. <laughs> But he was a joy germ and he left such an, an, an eternal imprint on our lives. Infectious. When we realise that we live in, un, in an unshakable kingdom, which means that we are unshakable citizens, because if the kingdom can't shake, I can't be shaken. Because the kingdom is stable and firm under my feet. I am unshakable. So the minute I shake, uh-oh, that's the old me trying to come back. So I recognise that and I just, well, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not shakable. I am immovable in Christ. The Father is wanting you to find the joy of life again. Sometimes it gets a bit serious. Sometimes it gets a bit hard. Sometimes people react in the way that you don't think they ever would. Sometimes family does things that you think, I can't believe my family's done that. All this kind of stuff. And that's because we live here. But if you live out of who you are, you are immovable, unshakable and unforgettable because you leave eternal deposits everywhere you go. And we need to remember joy is one of the, the themes, if you like, one of the things of heaven. And to release that on earth, particularly in the dark days, is a real key. And Jeunesse, when you let rip with your laugh, <coughs> I love it because it's free and it's infectious and it's joyous and it reminds me of the freedom that we have in heaven. Don't ever hold it back. Thank you. Oh my God, I got a yes, ma'am. Is that recorded, Danny? <laughs> so I just want to encourage you to find the joy of the Lord for yourselves to recognise that you are supernatural beings, that when you walk into his throne room as his, as, with him as your father, Abba, Yah, whatever your relationship with him is, whatever, he is joyously, rapturously greeting you. Oh, my gosh, Russell's here. Woohoo! 
you know. Oh, Peter and Ruth are here. We can talk about Israel. Yes. You know, but we don't often think that he's joyous or in f- eager. But he is because he's your father. <coughs> right? Change your relationship, guys. Or ask him to make it what he wants it to be. Ask him to make it what he wants to be. Ephesians 4 verse 20 says, But you did not so learn Christ, assuming that you've really heard him and been taught by him, as all truth is in Jesus, embodied and personified in him. Verse 22, and this is the Amplified Classic, Strip yourselves. This is something we do. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterised your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion or from deceit. Be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental, spiritual attitude and put on the new nature, the regenerate self created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness of the truth. So sometimes we have to sort of take off the old coat, a bit like um, Joshua when the book of Zechariah when his priestly garments were covered in dung. Sometimes we've got to come before the Lord and say, you know what, I'm a bit messy. I got caught up in a, in a whatever. I'm a bit messy but I just come before you now and I ask you to help me to strip off the old and to be re-robed with robes of righteousness. Clean turban on my head because we're all priests and kings and we can only do this by the power of the Spirit. Well, praise God, even though we didn't have tables or anything else, we've had a good time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua. Just love the joy of the Lord. I love the freedom that you give us. I love it. So, Lord, I pray for each and every one here and everybody on Zoom. And I pray, Father, that you would put on them the garment of praise and that the joy of the Lord would be released in them. Like it says, it bubbles up out of the wells of salvation with joy. So let that joy be released in and through everything we think and do and say and have and whatever this week. Let the joy of the Lord continue to increase. Let it be an expression that flows out of us, that touches other people. Let us leave uh, deposits of joy everywhere we go. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.